This is the story of Islam, our story. The hypocrites tried to spread trouble between the Muslims and create division. They said, let's deprive the Prophet ﷺ and his community of the money and the wealth and the support that you have and that we have. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayah, هُمُ الَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ لَا تُنْفِقُوا عَلَى مَنْ عِنْدِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ حَتَّى يَنْفَضُّوا وَلِلَّهِ خَزَائِنُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلَكِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ They are the ones who said, don't spend any other single penny on these emigrants and the Messenger of Allah so that we can force them out of the city of Medina and get them back to where they came from. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Allah belongs the treasuries of what's in the heaven of, and, and what's in the earth, but the hypocrites do not know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then showed what Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul said. Imagine the one who was hoping to become the leader of Medina. Now he's talking about Rasulullah sallallahu and he's saying, يَقُولُونَ لَإِن رَجَعَنَا إِلَى الْمَدِينَةِ لَيُخْرِجَنَّ الْأَعَزْ مِنْهَا الْأَذَلْ وَلِلَّهِ الْعِزَّةُ وَلِرَسُولِهِ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَلَكِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ They say if we return to Medina, the honorable amongst us, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, is going to force Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam out. The Quran says no, the honor and the power belongs to Allah and His Messenger, but the hypocrites fail to know. It was, it was a child, Zayd ibn al-Arqam, who heard Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul say this, that when we go back to Medina, I will personally force him out. Again, all talk. And of course, it shows you the real intentions of Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. So when Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul heard that he was discovered, he wanted to get himself out of trouble. So he ran to Rasulullah sallam, saying, Ya Rasulullah, I would never say such a thing. إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُنَافِقُونَ Allah reveals the ayah at the beginning of Surah Al-Munafiqoon. إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُنَافِقُونَ قَالُوا نَشْهَدُ إِنَّكَ لَرَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ إِنَّكَ لَرَسُولُهُ وَاللَّهُ يَشْهَدُ إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ لَكَاذِبُونَ The hypocrites come to you saying, you are the messenger of Allah. We bear witness that you are the messenger of Allah. Well, Allah knows that you are the messenger of Allah. They're falsely claiming that which they don't share or hold in their heart. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bears witness that they are lying. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul's own son came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and said, Ya Rasulullah, my father did say this and my father has been concealing all of this hatred towards you. But if you want, I will force him to stay out of Medina, never to return again. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa showing us, teaching us a lesson in forgiveness says, let them be, let him come and let him live Perhaps he's believing, perhaps he says it with his tongue, maybe one day he'll believe it with his heart. Now, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul's son comes to him and says, Dad, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi knows what's going on. He knows what you've said. Go and ask the Prophet Sallallahu for forgiveness. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ تَعَالَوْا يَسْتَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ لَوَّوْ رُؤُوسَهُمْ وَرَأَيْتَهُمْ يَصُدُّونَ وَهُمْ مُسْتَكْبِرُونَ When it's said to them, come, and tell the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tell him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that you want to be forgiven. They said, Abdullah said in disgust, they turn their heads away and say, no, we don't want, have, we don't want to have anything to do with Rasulullah. And they turned away with arrogance. As a result of their arrogance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَسْتَغْفَرْتَ لَهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تَسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ لَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَهْدِي الْقَوْمَ الْفَاسِقِينَ it doesn't matter, Ya Rasulullah, the Quran says, whether you pray for, your, for their forgiveness or you don't pray for their forgiveness, if they don't have the sincerity to ask themselves, they will not be forgiven. Surely Allah does not guide the rebellious people. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the same uh, ghazwa, Banu al-Mustaliq, something very tragic, very uh, troubling happened to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu own wife. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ جَاءُوا بِالْإِفْكِ عُصْبَةٌ مِّنْكُمْ لَا تَحْسَبُوهُ شَرًّا لَكُمْ بَلْ هُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ لِكُلِّ مِرِئٍ مِّنْهُمْ مَكْتَسَبَ مِنَ الْإِثْمِ وَالَّذِي تَوَلَّى كِبَرَهُ مِنْهُمْ لَهُ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ عبد الله بن أبي بن سلول told a terrible lie about Aisha رضي الله عنها in this battle, she was on the way back to Medina with the rest of the caravan, but she had to relieve herself. 
she, she distanced herself from the community, from the caravan on the way back. And what she, when she finished, she looked and she couldn't find the necklace. So she went back looking for the necklace that she had, realizing that she's lost it. It took her a while to find it. And when she found it, she was exhausted. She, she slept. And when she woke up, the caravan was already gone. And so Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, he noticed that she was late coming in to the rest of the caravan. And the Nabi Sallallahu would ask one of the companions, at this time it was Safwan ibn Mu'attal, to stay behind and to get anybody who was left behind. Safwan ibn Mu'attal brought Aisha to the rest of the caravan without speaking to her, just by singling or si signaling for her to get on top of the camel and to come back to the rest of the caravan. But of course, when Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul saw this, what did he say? He said, this is an atrocious, look at this, you think they were just there, but of course, and he just alluded to it one thing after the other to suggest that infidelity took place. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who accused Aisha of this atrocious lie, don't think it was something bad, don't think it was terrible, there's actually good in it because it shows who the hypocrites are and it's going to manifest and allow clear, clearly to be seen those who believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran says, لَوْلَا إِذْ سَمِعْتُمُوهُ ظَنَّ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ بِأَنفُسِهِمْ خَيْرًا وَقَالُوا هَذَا إِفْكُمْ مُبِينٌ If only the believing men and the believing women thought well of themselves and thought well of one another when they heard this rumor, they would have said, this is clearly an outrageous slander. And here we learn that Abu Ayyub al-Ansari and his wife looked at each other and said, would you say what they're saying about Aisha? Absolutely not. Well, if you wouldn't do it, Aisha is better. Would you, say, would you do what uh, they're saying about Safwan? Absolutely not. Well, Safwan is better. So if, they, if we ourselves would not do it, why would we say that they, the companions, the companion uh, Safwan and the Prophet's wife would do such a thing? So the good people thought good about themselves and because they saw good in themselves, they refused to accept the rumors. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُحِبُّونَ أَن تَشِيعَ الْفَاحِشَةَ فِي الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ أَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Teaching us when we hear these indecencies, we should not be quick to spread, we should not be quick to spread the rumors and say, look, look at this crazy, how am I, none of that. We put it aside, only those who are responsible to bring those people to justice get involved, but beyond that, we don't like to spread these rumors and these terrible things, and even if they're true, we don't spread them because what happens is it becomes again a reason for people to be desensitized to the wrong and to accept and to rationalize and it becomes a new norm. Abu Bakr seeing this terrible thing affect his own daughter, radiallahu anha Aisha, he refused to take care of one of the people that used to be in his own home with a little bit of a delay. And he said, this individual, Mustah ibn Thafa, he made again these accusations against Aisha. So Abu Bakr said, I'm not going to continue to pay him. I'm not going to continue to take care of him because how dare he say this about my own daughter. But the Quran comes to tell him to have patience. Do not let the people of virtue and affluence among you swear to suspend the donation to their relatives, to the needy, to the emigrants in the cause of Allah and let them pardon and let them forgive. Do you not want Allah to forgive you? Allah is the most forgiving and the most merciful. So Abu Bakr said, I want to be forgiven, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, forgive me. And he said, I will double what I used to give to Mustah beforehand. Soon after the Prophet Muhammad Sallam saw a vision in which he was entering Al-Masjid Al-Haram, the house of Allah, and he was entering the house of Allah wearing the clothing of Ihram, and he was entering the house of Allah, listen to this carefully, holding no weapons. And so he saw this, he was excited, he said, perhaps this is the time. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Fatih, لَقَدْ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ رَسُولَهُ الرُّؤْيَا بِالْحَقِّ لَتَدْخُلُنَّ الْمَسْجِدَ الْحَرَامِ إن شاء الله آمنين محلقين رؤوسكم ومقصرين لا تخافون فعلم ما لم تعلموا 
فجعل من دون ذلك فتحا قريبا. Now the Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم wanting to fulfill this vision and having trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wanting to enter the masjid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he went and he told the companions, it's time for us to go to to go to Mecca and to perform the pilgrimage. Now I want you to imagine just a few months ago, all these delegations came from everywhere to try to kill the people inside their own city in the city of Medina. And now Rasulullah is telling them, we're going to march and we're going to do pilgrimage, the minor pilgrimage in Mecca. They trusted Rasulullah and they went ahead with him and they went all the way to just outside the Kaaba, hoping to go in. And at that time, Quraysh intercepted them and said, how dare you? If you come into our own sanctuary after having just fought you, it would look really bad on us. We can't accept this. So they tried to send one person to negotiate, go back, go back, go back, or else we're gonna kill you, or else we're... All these intimidations, but Rasulullah remained his course. And he was just outside the Kaaba, outside the Haram area, the sanctuary. He could see it from afar. He could send some of the companions to see it. And he, he decided, we're going to send Uthman ibn Affan to negotiate on behalf of the Muslims. Now this is amazing because Quraysh is now in a position where they can't say no to them because this is a sanctuary. Everybody's supposed to come to the sanctuary and to be protected. And they're within the borders of the sanctuary. They managed to make it inside. So they can't be just turned away. And they can't be killed because that goes against the rules of being in the sanctuary. So they're now they're cornered between what are we going to do? And at the same time, we can't let them come in because that would look really terrible on us. We told all the Arabs, these are terrorists, these are bad people, these are people that are changing our ways, and now they're going to come into the house, the most sacred part, and do tawaf around the sanctuary? Doesn't make sense. So they're now trying to find a way around it. And they would send one person after the other until they sent one of the individuals, Suhail ibn Amr, who was able to negotiate with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed for a treaty to be signed between the two sides that would be called the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَهُوَ الَّذِي كَفَّ أَيْدِيَهُمْ عَنْكُمْ وَأَيْدِيَكُمْ عَنْهُمْ بِبَطْنِ مَكَّةِ مِنْ بَعْدِ أَنْ أَظْفَرَكُمْ عَلَيْهِمْ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بَصِيرًا It is He, Allah, the one who held them back and held your hands back from them and held them back from you in allowing you to come in the valley of Hudaybiyah and to emerge with having a peace treaty. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is well seeing of what you do. Now this is amazing because the conditions here were a bit unsettling for some of the Muslims that you have to go back this year and come back next year, that you're not going to be able to do Umrah this year, but you come back next year. And in addition to that, that anybody who becomes Muslim from Mecca would have to be turned back. And anybody who leaves Mecca, uh, anybody who leaves Medina to come to Mecca would be accepted. Now some of the companions said, Ya Rasulullah, these are tough conditions. He said, let it be. And they refused at the beginning, thinking and waiting, maybe a revelation will come to correct. We're right here, we can just go and do the Umrah, do the Tawaf. The house of Allah is right there. But an Nabi Sallallahu told them, trust and believe in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. There is good in this. Then the ayat were revealed. We have indeed given you, O Muhammad, a clear victory through this. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala nabiyyina wa habibina Muhammad. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed the Muslims to get a clear victory because of this. Why? Why is that the case? Because once they signed the peace treaty of Hudaybiyah with the mushrikeen, the people of Mecca, there was a period of now calm and peace. And during that time, the Muslims could send their delegations all over the place. So when Nabi Sallallahu started to send the Muslims in, in peace, again, having the security to all these different tribes, inviting them and asking them to join the Muslims and teaching them about Islam. At this time, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi sent all these messages written with his new seal, Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah. He sent a messenger to the Najashi of Abyssinia, and he sent a message to the Coptic leaders in Egypt, and he sent a messenger to the Persian and the Roman leaders, 
and in each and every one of them, especially when he's speaking to the people of the book, he would say, قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ أَلَّا نَعْبُدَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَلَا نُشْرِكَ بِهِ شَيْئًا ولا يتخذ بعضنا بعضا اربابا من دون الله فان تولوا فقولوا اشهدوا فقولوا اشهدوا باننا مسلمون he told them come i'm inviting you to a common word between us to say that we're not going to worship anybody besides allah and we're going to remain committed to allah and if you refuse to do so at least bear witness that we are Muslims. And Nabi Sallallahu then told his community, إِذَا فُتِحَتْ مِصْرُ فَاسْتَوْصُوا بِالْقِبْطِ خَيْرًا فَإِنَّ لَهُمْ ذِمَّةٌ وَرَحِمًا If you eventually end up in Egypt, be good to them, have kindness with them. And he told the same about Yemen, and he told the same about all these various regions, be kind. Then he sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal to Yemen, and he said, teach them Islam slowly, one step at a time, and don't be forceful, and don't be intimidating, and remember that they are a people of a book. Teach them first Islam, then the Salah, then when they're okay with that, and they've accepted it, and they've internalized it, then teach them the next step, and the next step, and the next step. Roughly at this time, an event takes place, or maybe a little bit earlier as well, but this is important for us to think about because it situates the discussion about the people of the book. Because sometimes when we talk about the people of the book from an Islamic point of view, we only focus sometimes on the wrong that was committed in the city of Medina. But the Quran says clearly, لَيْسُوا سَوَاءَ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ أُمَّةٌ قَائِمَةٌ قَانِتَةٌ That they're not the same. Some people, they're not all the same. They're not a monolithic group. Among the people of the book, you will find people that are kind and committed to believing in Allah. Many of them became Muslims and many of them had good relationships with Islam, even if they refused to do so, become Muslim. But as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, that there were those from Ahl al-Kitab that إِن تَأْمَنْهُ بِقِنْطَارٍ يُؤَدِّهِ إِلَيْكَ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ إِن تَأْمَنْهُ بِدِنَارٍ لَا يُؤَدِّهِ إِلَيْكَ The attitudes of Ahl al-Kitab were described in the Qur'an that some of them, if you give them a mountain of gold, they would give it back to you. They're trustworthy, they're committed, and others, they would not be able to give it back to you unless you continue to persistently remind and ask for it over and over again. At this time, after one of the battles, a person from Ahl al-Kitab was accused by Muslims was accused by Muslims. All this false story was made up against this individual, accusing him of stealing a shield from the Muslim community. But the Quran came and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna <laughs> وَاسْتَغْفِرِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا وَلَا تُجَادِلْ عَنِ الَّذِينَ يَخْتَانُونَ أَنفُسَهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ مَنْ كَانَ خَوَّانًا لَا يُحِبُّ مَنْ كَانَ خَوَّانًا أَثِيمًا يَسْتَخْفُونَ مِنَ النَّاسِ وَلَا يَسْتَخْفُونَ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَهُوَ مَعَهُمْ إِذْ يُبَيْتُونَ مَا لَا يَرْضَى مِنَ الْقَوْلِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it clear that those, O Muhammad sallallahu who came to you to try to convince you and blame and put the burden of blame on an innocent person, they are the ones that have lied. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came to prove the innocence of the Jewish man. Even though the person did not accept Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala proved his innocence. And in this same surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the importance of holding on to justice. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُونُوا قَوَّامِينَ بِالْقِسْطِ شُهَدَاءَ لِلَّهِ وَلَوْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِكُمْ Hold on to discipline and hold on to justice and stand up for truth and justice even if it's against yourself, even if it's against your father or your mother or those who are closest to you, even if it's against a poor person or a rich person, you fear for the person who's poor or you're you know, scared of the person who has wealth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, be committed to truth and truth alone and stand up for justice and justice alone. 
So again, it's important to contextualize and to balance this narrative about Ahl al-Kitab according to the Quran itself and according to the history of the Muslim community. Kisra, on the other hand, uh, we talked about Najashi and how Najashi was excited to come to Islam. He wanted to come to Islam and he actually became Muslim. But the other individual, Kisra, on the other hand, refused and he says, I would never submit myself to Muhammad. I would never accept the leadership of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And because of the arrogance, he was made to uh, be humiliated. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala tells us, or the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us, that eventually he would be crushed and humiliated and he was actually killed by his own brother or by his own son according to some of the books of history. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be from those who are of justice, allow us to be from those who are of fairness and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use us and not replace us and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to continue to embody the Quran and embody the Sunnah. We're trying to condense a lot of information in these small episodes. Inshallah, hopefully at least gives you the chapters and the titles so that we can study the seerah in detail and study it in relation to the Quran and from the lens of the Quran. So consider this an exciting opportunity and invitation to get to know the Prophet Muhammad better and to get to know the Quran better and to connect his life with the Quran from the lens of the Quran. Ramadan Mubarak and see you next time.